to the Americas, and we are very pleased to continue with our energy webinar series. And today we'll be actually continuing a, a bit of a conversation with uh, with a good friend and a, and a speaker from Mexico City, Carlos de Regules. And Carlos, we're always pleased to have you with us. Thanks for joining us today. Thank you, Jeremy. The pleasure is all mine. And I say this is a continuation um, of some things that we've been talking about at the Institute for a couple of reasons. Um, obviously, the Institute of the Americas and our energy program is working, uh, has been working for several years on uh, the energy sector in Mexico and obviously the host of reforms that have been put into place and are underway. But more specifically, the question of, of the regulatory environment and the long-term certainty of the regulatory environment the need for that regulatory environment to, to provide the uh, the security to investors that has been uh, developing, not just in the last couple of years with the major reforms, but but frankly going back uh, to, to the reforms of several years ago when the CRE was first created, later the CNH. And now we're, we're very pleased to have with us from the ASEA, which is one of the, the more recent creations of the, leg, uh, the energy regulatory environment in Me Mexico. Uh, and ASEA, for, for those of you who may or may not be aware, is the uh, regulatory body that was created to uh, to oversight the safety and security elements of the hydrocarbon sector in Mexico. And I, I'm not going to try and explain Carlos's agency, but I will say that it, it's an important addition to the regulatory, regulatory landscape in Mexico uh, as part of the 2013-2013 reforms. And by the way, congratulations to Carlos and his team at ASEA. They have built up a... Uh, a very strong and capable organization in just two years, and I, they celebrated their two-year anniversary just very recently. Um, and the final point I, I want to make, and, and why I say this again is a, a part of our continuation of this conversation in, uh, in terms of the regulatory environment in Mexico, is because January of 2017, Carlos de Regules was a guest author uh, for an Institute of the Americas white paper on best practices, but really how the regulatory model can incentivize investment and his thoughts in that paper on how practical use of regulatory measures can balance oversight with investment and actually be not necessarily reactive, but prescriptive is sort of what his, uh, but I'll, again, don't want to take away too much of what he's going to share with us today. Uh, we will use our typical format, and for those of you who have not joined us before, uh, we'll have a formal presentation at the outset that Carlos de Regules will, uh, will make. He'll have a few slides, some commentary, and then we'll go to our question and answer session. Uh, we'll use the chat function, so if you see right there on your lower left side of your screen, the chat function, um, anytime during the course of Carlos's presentation, feel free to, uh, to pose a question. We'll wait till he's done, and then we'll, uh, we'll review the questions, but don't, don't hesitate. If, you, if something comes up while he's speaking, go ahead and post it into the chat function, and we'll we'll get to that after the end of the formal presentation. So that's really it in the way of introduction. Uh, like I said, we'll uh, we'll wait to do the discussion afterwards. But again, I want to congratulate Carlos de Regules and his team at ASEA in Mexico for uh, for their two-year anniversary and and the work they've done in terms of standing up uh, from scratch a important regulatory body. That I should should add is is. In addition to Cray and, and CNH, part of the landscape, however, uh, not quite on the same level in terms of its independence. I say it does depend to the the seminar, the Environment Ministry. So, uh, one one distinction that's important that I think uh, Carlos will help us better understand. So, without any further ado, I'd like to invite Carlos de Regules to to share his remarks and um, look forward to your commentary and questions from everyone online. Thanks for joining us, Carlos. Please. Thank you so much, Jeremy, for the introduction. I think you have covered all the points that I was trying to make later, so uh, thank you for this uh, webinar. It was short ones. <laughs> so, no, I, I want to thank, uh, of course, uh, Jeremy and uh, and the Institute for always anticipating uh, the agenda for the relevant conversations uh, around uh, energy and uh, other, other issues uh, in Mexico, the U.S., and generally in the Americas. Uh, it would seem, I think, Jeremy, that you have the ability to read our minds. Uh, just last week, we conducted uh, an initial uh, private uh, event, a private conversation with some of our most relevant stakeholders around uh, around this issue of regulatory certainty. So it is a, a fantastic opportunity for me to uh, being able to share my thoughts on this issue now on a full scale 
public platforms uh, such as, as as this webinar. Uh, and, and I think, I guess I should start by stating the obvious, and that is that I am not a webinar professional. This is my first time, so you will have to bear with me. Uh, and uh, and now stating the the real obvious and, and going into uh, into the subject of our conversation this morning, uh, society and and markets uh, demand regulatory certainty. Uh, society, on one hand, in order to be confident that uh, the oil and gas activities uh, and this new phase of development of uh, the oil and gas market in Mexico uh, is being operated under robust prudential regulations. And of course, on the other hand, industry uh, needs certainty in order to have a clear a known and predictable regulatory framework and be able to factor in regulatory risk in their long-term uh, project portfolio. So why, why is it important to talk about regulatory certainty in Mexico at this point? I guess mainly, and this is some initial thoughts, mainly because the new regulatory instruments such as the contracts that have been uh, signed uh, the permits that have been given, the standards that have been produced, uh, the schemes for prior liberalization or the mechanisms for infra infrastructure, open access and others will soon begin or, or probably have already begun a first phase of testing. They were designed, they were uh, implemented and now they will be tested. And and secondly, I think it is important to talk about this because we need uh, to encourage a broader conversation, not only about uh, regulatory certainty, but about institutional resilience. Uh, indeed, the first generation of the energy reforms institutions uh, is there, it is up and running and, and gaining momentum in some cases, but uh, also uh, as they are put to test, they will eventually and most probably undergo some kind of revamp. So having said this, let me start by sharing what we have done in, in ASEA in order to advance regulatory certainty. And I should probably begin by saying what we do uh, and, uh, and then I'll go into some other details. So as Jeremy mentioned, we were created by the constitution uh, four years ago, we entered in, into operations three years ago, and, uh, and we have a very broad mandate. Uh, our mandate uh, is to regulate, to, uh, that, that is to say, to set the rules of the game. Uh, secondly, to evaluate and eventually authorize uh, all the new projects in the oil and gas uh, business. And thirdly, to uh, supervise and, uh, and enforce uh, compliance. And we do this in two main subjects, environmental protection and uh, industrial safety. And we do this for the whole value chain of uh, hydrocarbons from exploration to drilling, to production, to transportation, storage, processing, all the way down to the pump. So you're talking about uh, close to 300 offshore platforms, over 30,000 onshore belts, over 60,000 kilometers of pipelines, six refineries, nine gas processing centers, uh, over 100 large uh, product storage terminals, and uh, close to 12,000 uh, gas stations, and close to 5,000 other uh, BLP related uh, retail facilities. So it's a very broad uh, mandate that we have. And um, what we have done to advance regulatory certainty is that we basically have focused our efforts on attaining strategic points of no return that will guarantee continuity of our uh, regulatory uh, model. And I will be showing you that uh, regulatory model in a minute because I lost uh, the screen, but uh, uh, there you go. Is it is it showing the risk management model? Okay, so- uh, Yes, yes, Carlos. Okay, good. 
So uh, I assume most of our audience uh, today is not necessarily familiar with this model. So let me quickly walk you through it. And when you talk about avoiding accidents, spills, fires, uh, explosions in the oil and gas business, all you're talking about really is about managing risks. So that's the center of our, of our model, uh, risk management. And there are essentially uh, five instruments that a regulator can use to enhance risk management in this industry. And these are the five components of our regulatory model. I'll go briefly through each one of those. Uh, first, on the upper uh, left side of your screen, uh, the first uh, element of our regulatory model is safety and environmental management systems. Let me refer to those uh, as SEMS, safety, environmental and management systems. The obligation for every operator to operate under a SEMS induces active approach. You have to manage your specific risks before they evolve into incidents or accidents. So this is a, a preventive approach to managing uh, risks. The second element is, and you find it uh, up there on your uh, right uh, upper part of, of the screen, is financial responsibility. The obligation to have insurance policies sufficient to respond in a timely manner for the consequences of undesired events. We have to remember that this is an industry that handles uh, hazardous uh, products and uh, hazardous temperatures, pressures, and stuff. So, uh, so incidents can happen, and we have to be prepared for those. So both civil liabilities, environmental damages, and well control have to be ensured. The third element uh, is the first uh, uh, green box that you see there is performance-oriented regulations and standards that have an aim to facilitate the adoption of innovative and cost-effective solutions instead of the prescription of, let me say, say like this, kitchen recipes that may become obsolete in time. We have to remember that this is an industry that uh, innovates continuously. So if we put that innovation power uh, to serve safety and environmental uh, protection, I think we're doing the right uh, choice, and that is performance-oriented regulations instead of prescriptive uh, regulation. The fourth element uh, is uh, inspection strategies that are based on risk, risk-based inspection and third parties. You find it at the lower part of your, of your screen. Uh, these inspection strategies that are based on risk are intended to be precision shots instead of wide range uh, approaches. And of course, these have to be supported by the extension of the regulator's capacity. We would never have sufficient manpower to, uh, to oversee uh, every inch of the 60,000 kilometers of uh, pipeline uh, network that we have in Mexico. So we have to extend our capacity by the use of certified uh, third parties. And finally, uh, the fifth element of our model is corrective enforcement that is driven by the objective of closing risk gaps rather than catching people and imposing fines and penalties uh, and so on and so forth. Of course, we have uh, we also have very serious teeth if uh, if need be. Uh, so having gone through this uh, regulatory uh, model and again remembering that our efforts have been focused on attaining points of no return around this this model uh, what are what are these what are the points of no return we have attained we have uh, focused many of our efforts on the upstream business being one of our top priorities in terms of risks so let me uh, again go briefly through these uh, elements and some figures so far in terms of sems we have registered 50 sems out of the 50 that the new upstream players have submitted so far. So every new upstream activity uh, that will be coming into operation already has a detailed SAMS in place. Uh, 50 out of 50, and of course, uh, the, the next uh, uh, 
generation of operators uh, will be entering this pipeline and will be uh, submitting their SAMs to the authority and we will be registering those SAMs. Today, 50 have submitted it and 50 have been registered. Also, we have registered 14 insurance policies out of the 19 that the new upstream players have submitted so far. And so far, we're talking about uh, mainly the operators that will be uh, producing in the onshore mature fields. These are the less complex uh, operations. So, so far, uh, these 14 insurance policies add up to $1.5 billion for, again, uh, civil liability, environmental damage. And, uh, and of course, all of these uh, 14 and, and, and very uh, soon 19 new operators and the rest that are to come, uh, every new upstream activity will be sufficiently covered to cope with the consequences of potential accidents before operations begin. Uh, we also have published more than 30 regulatory uh, pieces across all the value chain from the upstream to, to retail. And all of these regulatory pieces uh, are based on international best practices. So there are no more significant regulatory gaps. We also have evaluated close to 25,000 new projects across the value chain. And this has allowed us to formalize acceptability criteria that have been valid for the current projects and that will remain to be valid for the future projects. We also have performed uh, 25, about 2,500 inspections and have produced a binding commitment from industry, mainly Pemex, the, the incumbent, to address the main risks in the offshore operations. So, uh, so far, this program has a progress of 92% and has uh, so far helped reduce very significantly the rate of accidents involved in the offshore operations. I have to say that when we initiated uh, operations in ASEA three years ago, one month into operation, we had the more severe accidentality crisis in the Gulf of Mexico, in the Mexican part of the Gulf of Mexico. And that was 2015. We we uh, put into action this this program that I was talking about, and one year later, 2016 was the best historical year in terms of uh, accidentality performance for uh, the upstream uh, part of, uh, of of the industry in Mexico, and 2017 was even better. So we think that these uh, corrective programs are helping industry actually achieve a better performance. And uh, finally, uh, and this is very important, a variety of our actions from the regulations we have issued, the permits and the authorizations we have uh, granted to the sanctions that we have imposed, all of those, a variety of those, have been subject of uh, lawsuits. And the interesting uh, part of it is that tribunals have ruled in favor of ASEAN in 90% of the cases. And that is uh, really outstanding in terms of uh, public administration performance uh, in litigation in Mexico. And, and this is relevant, uh, how this is relevant, you may ask, this is relevant because it represents the progressive confirmation of our regulatory model by the courts, by the tribunals. And, and this, of course, having this judicial and legal precedent or, or, or background uh, is a very important uh, point of no return because no matter what happens in the coming months or years, the tribunals have already fixed the criteria by which they will be judging uh, the, the actions of the authority. So now that we have attained these uh, points of no return concerning the regulatory model, uh, probably the, the relevant question is what comes next in terms of building uh, regulatory certainty for the long term. Uh, and I would say there are a, a couple of things that need to be done. Of course, there is work uh, that we have to do uh, in order to optimize our operations, uh, expand our flagship strategies beyond the upstream operations, 
prepare, of course, for a much higher demand on our inspection uh, capabilities once all the new contracts begin drilling and producing and uh, prepare for a vast expansion of new midstream projects. Uh, and that has to do with optimizing our, our, our operation. That's something that we need to work on. But uh, most importantly, I think we need to secure a more robust institutional design. Jeremy was uh, introducing, in, introducing a very important uh, aspect of this when he was uh, at the beginning of this conversation. A few months ago, the OECD finalized an assessment of the integrated regulators system in the energy sector. And uh, the integrated regulator system is basically CNH in the upstream, CRE for midstream and, and retail operations, and ASEA covering the whole value chain. Uh, two of the main findings uh, that OECD uh, signaled is that ASEA lags behind in terms of independence and also that it is governed by a series of outdated procedures that were not reset at the time of the energy reform. Uh, and so the OECD recommendations are one, to align ASEA to the other two regulators, uh, so as to make the system integrally robust instead of having one weak link. We have to remember that a system is as robust as its weakest component. So what is uh, to be done ahead? One is we have to promote a legal reform that will give ASEA more autonomy, more independence, equipping it with a board of commissioners that take decisions jointly and that are, uh, as, as is the case in CNH and CRE, uh, appointed for fixed period of, periods of time, stacked one after the other, so they transcend the uh, political cycle, and with very high remotion uh, criteria. So uh, we make sure that these people that are taking uh, decisions jointly are there for the long term and, the, and thus ensuring uh, the continuity of, uh, of decision making. Uh, and of course, ensuring the continuity of the regulatory model and protecting it from the political cycles, as I mentioned. This reform, the good news is that this reform is being discussed. It was presented in Congress uh, last week and is being discussed uh, as we speak. We have to wait uh, probably five to 10 days to finally find out what will happen with this reform. But the good news is that it's already being uh, it's already being discussed by by Congress, and I do believe with a fair amount of uh, of good uh, support from different uh, political perspectives. The second thing that we have to do is get approval for the implementation of a full scale re-engineering of the old procedures that define how we carry out our permits. We have to remember that. Uh, as opposed to CRE and CNH uh, that operate under only two federal laws, the hydrocarbons law and the uh, co and the uh, regulator coordinated regulators law, ASEA operates under ten different uh, federal laws and the procedures that we derive from those laws. And these procedures are as old as the 1980s, 1990s, the 2000, the 2010. And so there are uh, certain uh, inconsistencies or, or gaps uh, and, and, and we have to make a reset of this. The initiative we, we, we have presented will allow, would allow us to compress in one single initial permitting moment, the different environmental authorizations that today are dispersed, are scattered, and that duplicate uh, information. Also, it will it would allow us to connect the, all the environmental permitting with the safety authorizations and actually have integral risk, uh, a risk approach to uh, integral authorizations. This initiative, again, uh, is already being discussed with the Executive Legal Council and if approved and implemented, would cut down permitting time from a worst case scenario of uh, 600 days 
to a maximum of 120. So uh, it would be a dramatic leap in terms of regulatory efficiency. Uh, so far, we have uh, discussed then uh, what deals with what has been done and what needs to be done to advance regulatory certainty, uh, mainly in the case of ASEA. I have also touched on some aspects of, uh, of the whole system of integrated regulators, CMH, CRI, and, and ASEA. But as I said at the beginning of this conversation, uh, I think that we need to adopt a broader approach and look beyond ASEA and look beyond CRE and CMH and actually consider the whole new institutional uh, arrangement uh, around uh, the energy sector and talk actually about institutional consolidation. That's the next uh, slide that uh, I'm showing there in, in the screen. Uh, and we have to, of course, uh, address the strengthening regulators uh, system. I've, I've discussed that already, but we need to pay special attention to building mechanisms that improve a timely coordination between federal, state, and local authorities, uh, and also take steps towards the specialization of administrative and judicial tribunals that guarantee uh, an efficient rule of law in this particular sector. The specialization of tribunals, I think, will be a paramount conversation in the coming, in the coming months. Uh, we also uh, need to address the consolidation of a strong domestic uh, and, uh, and also a regional market. We have to strengthen the value creation mandate and the entrepreneurial capabilities of Pemex, the incumbent player in the in the market. There is no uh, strong market uh, with a weak incumbent. We have to uh, have a, a thriving Pemex, a very industrious Pemex, and with a, a strong uh, entrepreneurial uh, capabilities. Uh, by the way, this was also a finding that the uh, upstream uh, companies association uh, here in Mexico, the Amexi presented uh, yesterday as uh, part of, the, of their key uh, recommendations uh, moving forward. Um, we also have to uh, begin uh, the design and the deployment of new schemes derived from our recent incorporation to the International Energy Agency and, of course, uh, from the new energy and regulatory best practices chapters within NAFTA. We have our fingers crossed <laughs> uh, on this subject, but uh, I guess it's a very good uh, sign that NAFTA, the NAFTA chapter on uh, regulatory best practices has been finalized and that there is a very large uh, amount of optimisms uh, around the energy chapter as well. So uh, we'll be uh, hoping that uh, our leaders are able to, to move this forward. And then finally, uh, we also have to pay attention to, uh, to uh, social licensing and, the, and engaging with the efficiently with different stakeholders. So defining appropriate procedures for the social licensing of projects, including uh, probably not probably but absolutely le uh, producing uh, legislation uh, for the that addresses the indo indigenous free prior and informed uh, consultation this is an an international agreement that mexico is part of and it has already been put down also in in federal laws in the hydrocarbon law but we still need to uh, legislate around uh, this issue uh, also, we have to uh, produce formal regulation for social impact evaluation uh, and, and mechanisms for the transparent sharing of benefits with the owners of, of the land. This will be of paramount importance. Uh, we also need to pay attention to, uh, to producing efficient contact rules to maintain a structured dialogue and a transparent dialogue with uh, between regulators, industry, and society. So, again, in terms of institutional consolidation, these are just some of the some ideas uh, for us to to consider. Um, I am 
sure and I am thrilled about, uh, about uh, the fact that ahead of us lies the challenge of defining uh, the strategic agenda for institutional consolidation or uh, as someone has uh, already mentioned, a second uh, generation of uh, institutional reforms for the energy sector in, in Mexico. So uh, with this, I am sure that organizations like the Institute of the Americas and, and others, both uh, in Mexico, Mexico, in the United States and, uh, and abroad, and will abroad. be closely looking at this challenge and coming up with very interesting proposals that help advance this conversation. So I uh, thank you all of you for your patience so far this morning, and we'll be happy to listen to your comments, uh, read your questions, and thank you very much. Thank you, Carlos. Appreciate those insights, and as always, a, a very, very interesting and insightful discussion. Uh, you you were able to share an enormous amount of ideas and concepts in, in what was really two slides. So that was uh, quite impressive. There are some questions and, and thank you, George Baker, uh, but to hope some others uh, I, I've you know noted before, we'll use the chat function for the question and answer session. Uh, I've got a few questions I want to follow up and I, and I appreciate some of the, the final points you made. But let's go ahead and start with something that George has posed here. I, I think you addressed the question to a certain degree, particularly the results and recommendations of the OECD report. But the, George is asking, do you think that ASEA should have a commission-like structure such as CNH and CRE? Let me throw something in there because we've talked a lot and I've heard you explain in, in very eloquent terms why um, ASEA should have a, a far more uh, autonomy and level of independence. But but let me ask you something and without dragging this back too much, but just make a brief comment if you would about why during the reform process uh, ASEA was indeed created in the fashion it, it is in terms of its organizational structure and dependency within some or not. Okay. If you, so, if you uh, could. Yeah. Yeah. Sure, of course. Uh, and, uh, and of course, thank you, George, for those uh, for, for that question. And uh, why ASEA wasn't created originally like CRE and CNH uh, is something that I have been uh, very curious about. I was not a part of that decision. And what I have found is that uh, there was a, a, a group of, uh, of uh, lawmakers, lawmakers that supported that the idea supported of the idea making ASEA independent as an autonomous as CRE and CNA. But there was also a certain concern that a plan that our situation should be able to mature initially under the umbrella of a full uh, scale and already uh, mature um, minister. So I guess that was the, the, the decision that was uh, taken to uh, give this new institution the opportunity to mature under the umbrella of the uh, mm -hmm. uh, uh, But uh, very soon uh, we have attained full maturity and I am absolutely convinced that we need to take the, the next step. Uh, and then going to George's uh, question is uh, uh, ASEA should have a commission like structure. structure? Absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, Absolutely. You want to have uh, a continuity uh, of the regulatory uh, model. And for uh, in order to have that, you have to have a continuity of the decision making process. Uh, uh, and that's exactly what a board of commissioners that are appointed for uh, fixed periods of time and stacked one after the other. Uh, and with very high uh, uh, criteria for their remotion uh, provides. And, and, and interestingly, an, an anecdote I, I, I like to share is that uh, I was recently asked uh, uh, by, by uh, one of the uh, secretaries here in Mexico, is, uh, he said, are you sure you want a, a board of commissioners uh, and are you sure you want to negotiate and are you sure you want to discuss and are you uh, the decisions and my answer was very candid I said uh, secretary I don't want it for me I want it for the next staff 
and, and the reason for my answer is that uh, sitting at the chair that I have been sitting for the last uh, three years, uh, basically uh, deciding uh, very uh, rapidly upon important questions have been, has been so far uh, very good for us. It has allowed us to move quickly and swiftly, uh, but it also uh, has a downside to it. Uh, which is the level of um, of um, yeah of, of, of freedom uh, you have to make good decisions but also bad decisions. So I guess you want to institutionalize the decision making process within uh, within ASEA in order to have sound, robust, long term uh, decisions. No, for certain. I, it's funny. I, I I had wondered as you were speaking earlier about the creation as to you know how much time you spent trying to carve out that level of independence. And so I think it's well put that it's not just for for your management and, and time at ASEA, but obviously for the future and the next executive director and the one after that, et cetera. So let's. Uh, George has another specific question here that uh, I think fits in well. And, and then I want to pivot to a couple of other things um, uh, you brought up at the very end, especially this question of social license and the license to operate. I think these are important topics. Um, and I also want to finish with what you called regulatory resilience. But first, uh, George's other specific question is, what are the legal or regulatory requirements or standards for certified third-party inspectors? By whom are they certified? So this might take us a bit into the weeds, but why don't you explain a little bit how that works and, and, and how ASEA has developed that capability and certification process? Okay, sure. Okay, uh, sure. And, uh, and as I was uh, saying, uh, there, is, uh, there is no sufficient uh, manpower man in, in, the, in any regulator, actually, uh, to uh, supervise uh, the whole value chain and, uh, and et cetera. So, we need to expand uh, the, the state uh, capacity uh, in, in using third parties. And the way we do this is that for every piece of regulation that we publish, uh, the upstream regulation, the midstream regulation, storage, uh, retail, or whatever, uh, after that comes a, an, an open uh, um, call for third parties to uh, come forward uh, to ASEA, present their credentials, their experience, their certifications, and be able to offer uh, two kinds of services. One is uh, third parties certifying uh, upon the design of the projects, upon the robustness of, uh, of this uh, design. And secondly, third parties to, um, to oversee uh, regulatory compliance. And so the way this happens is that companies will, will respond to this, uh, to this open uh, call, uh, which states obviously what are the requirements to become a third party. Uh, those requirements will be assessed uh, by the Mexican uh, accreditation entity. Uh, and with that first uh, filter, let's say, of, uh, of uh, appraisal, then it will be for us, for ASEA, to review these credentials and the experience that uh, the different companies and individuals present in order to authorize them to become uh, ASEA's third parties. And, and our model does not stop there. Our model uh, goes uh, tip to tip. Uh, once we uh, authorize a third party to produce, uh, provide these services, we also supervise uh, the third parties uh, uh, in order to make sure that the services that they are providing are uh, of quality and timely, transparent, and independent. Should we find that a third party is not uh, conducting its business on this uh, on this criteria? Uh, of course, we have the mechanism to deauthorize or uh, deauthorize this third party not only as a company but also the individuals within that company. So this is a very powerful uh, incentive 
uh, for third parties to behave uh, accordingly. And, uh, and uh, we have produced we have 140 new third parties for this market. Wow, so 140 third party that you've certified and are, are in the process of, of executing inspections. Okay. So let's let's take that and perhaps it's not a, a direct segue, but um, the last one of the last points you made on on your on your final slide had to do with uh, specifically the prior consultation, but but you know really this this the idea of the social license to operate. So two two ways I'd like to have you uh, share some further insights or two areas for further insights. One, can can you explain a little bit where indeed Mexico? So you said that as part of the federal law. Uh, and it's part of the reform uh, measures that you know, the prior consultation law, which, as you said, is an international ag uh, agreement that that countries sign sign on to, and then implement at the, the the national level. Maybe explain a little bit more exactly, because you said there's some legislation around that missing. So maybe help uh, help understand. I'd like to understand a little bit better what that means. Um, and then another part of it is what role does a SEA have? Now, I, I, my understanding, I could be wrong, is that SENER tends to be more the lead um, institution in Mexico when it comes to the issues of community engagement and stakeholder engagement and these questions. So, like I said, the, the, the second point of the, the that I'd like to hear your insights is where SEA fits into that broader um, effort by the government and industry alike to to really manage and balance stakeholder and community engagement. Yeah, of course. Uh, thank you, John. So the first uh, issue is uh, Mexico has been part of, uh, of uh, Treaty 169 from the International uh, Labor Organization. Uh, and this treaty uh, is, it makes it mandatory for for the countries that have signed it uh, to have processes by which uh, indigenous communities, indigenous peoples are consulted under uh, three uh, criteria. That this consultation is free, that it is prior uh, to any infrastructure project, and that it is informed so that uh, communities and indigenous peoples uh, it can also make an informed uh, decision about these uh, projects. Uh, I guess the problem with this is that it hasn't been uh, broken down into a specific law so that we can understand what this means. Uh, because it's, it's a, a very broad concept and I guess everybody will agree on the importance of doing so, but the question is not about the importance of doing so, but mainly on how to do it. And that needs uh, to be, uh, that needs to become a specific law, uh, in my understanding, uh, that concerned with, uh, with uh, this indigenous pri free prior and informed uh, consultation. Uh, I understand there has been um, uh, proposals of uh, legislating this issue uh, that have not uh, prospered so far. And I think it's uh, absolutely relevant that we can produce this le legislation very soon. Um, and going to your second question about uh, social impact, stakeholder engagement, and how the AI is involved, uh, it, it's a similar thing to the, to the previous question. Uh, environmental impact, uh, uh, sorry, uh, social impact uh, evaluation is a new uh, requirement that was introduced uh, three years ago by the hydrocarbon law. Uh, and, and the fact is that there, today there is no formal regulation about how to do it. There are some guidelines and there are some uh, processing in place, but no formal regulation has been put forward. Uh, so uh, today there is not a clear and neat uh, form of, con of conducting these environmental, uh, these social impact assessments. And going to your question of how ASEA is involved with this, uh, our, our main environmental um, regulatory uh, instrument is, of course, environmental impact assessment. 
And when you think about the, the contents of the environmental impact assessment and the contents of the social impact assessment, actually they go pretty much hand in hand. Uh, I think that one interesting approach uh, for, for the future would be trying to, uh, to link those together and have one single process for social and environmental impact assessment. This would produce a, a, a greater uh, detail and depth in analyzing uh, the integral uh, impacts of, 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 uh, of a new oil and gas project and would allow uh, the authority to produce also uh, more robust authorizations. And uh, I think this is an idea that we need to, to, uh, to, uh, to produce, uh, to produce uh, very shortly. Hey, hey, Carlos, it's almost as if you looked at my notes for my next question. <laughs> I literally, uh, when you say one single process, no, honestly, thank you uh, for that answer. And what I honestly wanted to ask you next was you're, you're very aware of some of the criticism associated with the, the tramitologia, the, the over, the bureaucratization, some argue, has taken place in the wake of, of the institutional, you know, basically restructuring in Mexico with the reform. And so um, I, I think what you just talked about is one way to start to work around that. But I'd like your broader thoughts, um, it, not just in response to this sort of criticism that, that, that I'm sure you've heard and we've heard at different institute discussions and roundtables and our friends in industry are very quick to, to point out. And, and um, so I think it's part of a, a, something else maybe you mentioned, which is regulatory resilience. Obviously, it's part of the longer term outlook. But uh, how do you see, you know, trying to indeed, such as a process you just described, what are some of the other areas or ways that uh, that not just ASEA, but the entire government and, and regulatory frame bodies and framework in Mexico can begin to uh, see a clearer path forward to reduce some of the regulatory, because there's regulation and then there's burden. So I, I guess my question would be, how do you address that? Absolutely. And that's a, Absolutely. a, a, that's a very a, important question. Uh, what I have read uh, in literature and that then what I have experienced in real life is that when uh, new regulations come into place or a new market is opened or a new activity is allowed uh, in a certain market, uh, the first uh, generation of regulations will probably tend to be to, to over-regulate actually. And I have to say this very candidly. As a regulator, when you're facing uh, the option of uh, how deep you go in the regulations, and if you want to stay uh, on the safe side of, of, uh, of this level of, uh, of uh, standardization, uh, you often take the decision to uh, over-regulate. Of course, this is not an intentional decision, but that's where you end up. Uh, and we, and we need to see how this first generation of regulations uh, operates in order to find out what needs to be optimized. But that's a, a, that's a fact and this is no, uh, it, it's not only in Mexico, it has happened and will continue to happen uh, across the world. Now, what needs to be done? I think uh, coordination is the name of the game. And uh, this, again, is one of the recommendations that we obtained from OECD. OECD said, uh, listen, guys, CNH, CRE, and NASEA share the same market. They share the same regulated uh, entities. Uh, you need to put in place common planning processes so that you are on the same page in terms of what are the regulatory challenges facing this uh, this this market that you three are regulating. So an integral planning, strategic plan. Uh, also, uh, you have to have an instance of coordination, a formal instance of coordination, where uh, you make sure that you are not overburdening uh, the market with uh, requirements and move towards common processes and eventually move towards common uh, digital platforms uh, where uh, it is transparent for the end user, uh, whether there is one, two or three regulators behind the screen, 
it's an integral process. And, uh, and I think we have made some progress in these regards. We already have a common strategic plan for the system of uh, regulators, CRE, CNH, and ourselves. And you can find uh, that one in any one of our websites. Um, we have also produced a first uh, attempt to uh, walk uh, the regulated entities through our very complex integrated uh, processes. So, if, and th we call this the ODAC, La Oficina de Atención uh, Coordinada. So, yeah, the, 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 the place where you want to go in order to find out what uh, the three regulators are asking for in an integral manner. Um, we also have uh, made progress in terms of digital platforms. We are already sharing uh, a digital platform with CRE where uh, the, the, the regulated entities that have been registered by CRE uh, will be uh, with no more uh, bureaucratic burden will be registered before ASEA as well. Uh, and we're working, working to do the same thing with, with CNH. So I guess, uh, yeah, in terms of, uh, of uh, lowering bureaucracy and tramitología, the name of the game is coordination, common platforms, common processes. Uh, and that I think that would be my, my answer to your question, Jeremy. Sure, I, I appreciate the personal anecdote. That's very. Um, once you're sitting in the chair of the regulator, uh, that that's a much different vantage than, as you noted, uh, reading the literature and, and sort of so. Though I appreciate the personal anecdote, and it seems to me, and you hinted at this, um, uh, technology and, and and sort of the like you said, the digital platforms should really, really be able to to help you and your colleagues in the regulating uh, entities in Mexico. I was struck recently, um, you may have seen it as well, that the, the electric regulator, the power market regulator in Chile, CME, is employing blockchain technology um, as part of its, its, its structure. I'm not quite clear exactly what that's going to entail, but the headline was, was captivating. And, and obviously, blockchain, people think of cryptocurrencies, but really it's also a, a digital transaction that's very transparent and open source and allows for real-time um, input from a, a host of participants. So what, without belaboring that point, I, I think everything you mentioned there is, is uh, I think technology is going to only help uh, reduce traffic So um, thank you for that. We're, we're almost out of time, which is always what happens. It's, it's, it's always so enjoyable. There's one final question, but let me, uh, let me just be sure I remind people that the Institute has events coming up. We'll be in Argentina next week. Uh, we're also delighted to be working with the government of Jalisco and the Energy Agency from Jalisco, as well as the U.S. Commercial Department from the Mexican, uh, U.S. Embassy in Mexico City to host a group at the Institute on April 25th. So please join us in person, either in Argentina or at the Institute. And then, of course, it's never too, too early to mention the La Jolla Conference on May 23rd and 24th. And Carlos, I believe you'll be able to join us again this year and continue to share this conversation at the La Jolla Conference. Absolutely. We Absolutely. Thank you. We love having you. Thank you so much. Um, so be sure to follow us on social media as well. And I'm going to end with a very uh, easy question for Carlos. Um, you mentioned something sort of in passing, but I want to go back to it to wrap up today. And and it was a commentary uh, about Pemex. And you worked for many years at Pemex. You you have a a distinct uh, your legacy with Pemex, but you said something along the lines of it's not easy, or you cannot have a strong market with with a weak. I think you say incumbent. Yeah. Without getting too much into that, is sort of the, the final commentary for our webinar today. What 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 do you mean there? Uh, and perhaps it's more of a personal anecdote. Well, uh, well you know, uh, you know Femex, Femex is uh, basically operating operating most uh, most relevant infrastructure for logistics, uh, logistics of, uh, petroleum uh, products, uh, products, 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 mainly petroleum yeah. products. Uh, so you you really want to have a very strong operator and a very uh, an operator with a business uh, mindset uh, operating at infrastructure because we want to secure open access and you want to secure open access uh, in in market in fair market uh, terms. So obviously, when when there is a such a powerful incumbent in a market. Uh, you have to have uh, um, regulations that are specific 
uh, to that incumbent and that do that apply only to that very large uh, incumbent and not to the rest of the of the market. But in order to for those um, uh, regulations uh, to to be effective, behind that you need an incumbent, a very powerful company such as as Pemex that is prepared to go into into this new phase with uh, sufficient entrepreneurial uh, capabilities and sufficient uh, freedom for uh, decision making and for uh, prioritization of its uh, project portfolio. So that's uh, something that uh, comes up every time we discuss this with, with industry, be it uh, the upstream or, or, or the midstream. They are all convinced that it, because of this reason, it was very um, interesting for me to see that Amexi uh, yesterday presented their 2040 uh, um, uh, diagnostic and, uh, and, uh, and prospective. And one of the 10 top recommendations that Amexi is doing is uh, we need to strengthen Pemex. No doubt. I think we, we would all agree. And if you if you think about what they were uh, ascribed in round zero, I'm, uh, anyone who thinks Pemex doesn't have a major role um, is, is certainly mistaken. So, well, it's uh, it's actually one minute after uh, the hour. We are uh, officially at the end. Thank you so much, Carlos Terragules. Thanks to uh, to Luis Martinez in your office and your team. Jacqueline Sanchez, thanks for your help on the, on the webinar today. And thank you, everyone who joined us. We've wrapped up yet another installment of the Institute of the Americas Energy webinar series. Uh, we'll get this recording posted online and out to everyone later today for download. Thank you so much. And as, as previously noted, continue this conversation with us at the La Jolla Conference. It's always, it's always enjoyable and always enjoyable to do so in person. Thanks again, Carlos. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Jeremy. And thanks for the audience. Thank you, George. Have a great day, everybody.